Welcome to Fan Service, your live weekly geek field trip into the world of pop culture, and we're super happy to have you guys here. Yes. Gavin is going to explode with excitement and unicorn. Today. He's been we talking have... nonstop. <laughs> nonstop. Like Someone, I, I like to talk. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> no, but no, we no. have an amazing show lined for you. But first, I am Gavin, one of your hosts, and I'm joined by Jeffrey. Hey, everyone. <laughs> I'm the Konami code that is Pocky, aka Chris. <laughs> so um, we're wrapping up video game month because Harley can't be here today. She had some issues, so we're kind of filling in. But it's okay because this is going to pretty much be the Pocky Gavin show today. I guarantee you because we're wrapping up video game month with our tribute to Sega. Like every, all of you who've watched this show know how much I gush about Sega and Pocky somewhat. Jeffrey's loaded because he doesn't have a damn clue. <laughs> I, I played some Sega, with, but I, I was grew up with the Nintendo. Master System. That tells you how much of a Sega fanatic See, I am. And I, 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 I had a friend who had the Master System. I enjoyed the idea of the Master System. I had a Super Nintendo because I liked RPGs, uh, but they had a lot of RPGs. This is like so. But no, no. But I was the Sega Dreamcast guy all the way. Oh. So yeah, and this is our end of season seven. Eight. Seven. Season yeah. seven. This is because we go eight. six months at a time, so next month kicks off season eight. And we have even more fun, but we I want to go out with the bang. So we have Tom Kalinske, president of Sega of America during the console oh, wars, wow. helped create Sonic the Hedgehog we know and love, and all the consoles we know and love. Innovation just oozes out of this man. He's on Skype with us today as we just lose our crap about Sega. So I'm looking forward to that. But first and foremost, we're going to get to this week's news. Are we ready for this? Yes. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right see, the, your idea of news and my idea of news is so much fun different. I like you to see this. Your news uh, is boring. All right. Whatever. Oh. Whatever. I picked the fun stories. Like, for instance, this week, well, actually last week, Sega Forever actually finally launched. It's yeah. the free mobile game. And it kind of was a, a, a nightmare. Things aren't working right. I tried to do Sonic the Hedgehog. It wasn't really working on the phone. Like, I don't understand why they didn't go the subscription route where you could just play their whole catalog for a monthly fee. Like, that would have been the way to go. Be considered the fact they created Sega. We're going to talk about Sega Channel during the topic. But they, they know how to do it. But why did they do it right? I, I think the, the, the part of it is is that with the subscription by each model versus the, the pay at once model, I can understand because Sega has such a huge library of what they actually produced, what they published, and what was on their systems. I can see, like, hey, if you want just Golden Axe, you want the first two Sonic games, and let's say you want Shining Force. They had, I would do a subscription to them in a heartbeat. Most people would. Like, True, I have Xbox I mean, Game I can... Pass right now, and it's working really well. Are you sure you haven't already done a subscription? <laughs> With the amount of Sega that you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> to my house. Like, um, yeah, it's like a uh, fortress. I, I, I can understand why. I mean... Some people would want subscriptions. Some people just want one game, one game, you know, like Sonic. Well, yeah. I, but they already have that on the consoles. You can buy the one shot, one shot games here and there. They have the vintage mm -hmm. collections on the Xbox, which I have all of them. <laughs> I'm not even I just can't lie. wait to play Sonic Mania. I'm just saying. Yeah, I have Sonic Mania it's... already pre-ordered with the statue, all uh, that stuff. So you did too. Yeah. I'm yes. Gonna, that way sits forever today. <laughs> I'm just but gonna buy it on day one. It'll be yeah, interesting to see how this plays out over time if they fix the issues because not everything is really good for mobile. Sonic, I couldn't get him to go where I wanted to go on mobile. It was just bad. Yeah. Like, Space Harrier, I could see working. Maybe Altered Beast, because all you do is go, oh, 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 and turn into an animal. I mean, there's not much to it. Can you do that again, please? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. now, now, of course, the question is, how's the speedrunning community going to run with this? Ooh. All right, so next up. <laughs> Anonymous oh, this is a good one. said that NASA set to reveal the existence of alien life. Wait, That's wait, wait, nowhere. Wait, wait. They said we hacked NASA. They have evidence and, alien life is intelligent and it exists, and they're gonna release it. I'm like, and it's like you haven't heard from like a lot of people say they haven't heard from Anonymous for a while, and then out of nowhere, NASA and aliens. I'm just like, what <laughs> really? is this? No more political posts. Just NASA and aliens. No, no like, more, <laughs> no more political posts. No more going after Kanye West. It's like space alien. I'm not saying it's space aliens. 
but, but it's space, space aliens. aliens. <laughs> so, like, did the Donovan's get hacked by that guy who was like control of like a, a, a History Channel at one point? Like, I, I think this is hilarious. I can't wait to see if this is true. Because I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are hoping it is true. But a lot of people finding this very, uh, it's just a joke. I'm whatever. also thinking. What do they look skeptical. like? I hope they're like pint sized. They're like, like I just hope they're angry midgets. No, <laughs> angry actually, midget aliens would just be hilarious. <laughs> like, I, I, no, I actually read what was Smurfs. that? What was that one movie we watched during South by Southwest? The experiment video where the aliens were just giant. Oh yeah, and they were like jacking with the office worker. Yes. I mean, right. I can, yeah, yeah, it's true. Found South footage, one hundred one X, like those guys were made. That was a funny movie, right? What if they're that? Oh what if the reason NASA has never revealed it because aliens are just giant dicks that all they do is just dick with us all the time? Well, that would explain a lot of things happening in the world. Yes, today. it would. All right, next up, the Resident Evil Two. My favorite Resident Evil game Jeez. is officially getting an HD remake, nice, but without the original cast. It's completely. Wait, 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 wait. Are we saying Resident Evil 2, the movie, or Resident no, Evil 2, the, the video game? The, the, it's okay. the video game. That is by far Not the movie. The movies are done, I think, right? Yes, no, they're they rebooting the movies already. Yeah, <laughs> later. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. So don't they're worry. actually about it. Stop really rebooting them, please. Rebooting it and <laughs> doing just like they did with the original the original one that they made in HD on the GameCube, but none of the original cast is coming back. So they're all new voice actors. Oh, nice. just like, that's not nice. I know, I, who, no, I, I know what Leon sounds like. Well, I know... Okay, I know that game okay. backwards and forwards. Well, right. it's always fun to see like new stuff come out and everything. Else then like make that. a new game. Why reboot right. a game? Like, like I can why just... reboot the movies? Well, I mean, like it, I, I'm, I'm going to side with Gavin on this one. If you're going to make a Resident really? Evil two game, yes. If you're going to make a Resident Evil game, and you're going to set it in Raccoon City, <laughs> just do that. Just say, hey, this is Raccoon, you know, Resident Evil Raccoon City, you know, the like the was... Operation Umbr uh, Umbrella. Yeah, the or, the Umbr or the Umbrella. Okay. Or the yeah. Raccoon City Chronicles, where it's like. These are people who are also trying to get out at the same time. They did that with Resident Evil and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, where they said, this takes place before and then during the 24 sucks. hours. What? Two was the last good game. <laughs> Nemesis actually was really good, in my opinion. Anyways. Wait, so what about it'll be four? interesting to see how this decides to play out. Let's save that for Geek vs. Geek. Not nearly as much as this next <laughs> one. Monopoly has now launched a line called Gamer with Mario. If you guys have not seen it, it's on our Facebook page. It is Mario World Monopoly, but you're getting coins that you can drop. You have boss battles every time you pass go. It's timed. There's only eight bosses to beat. And every character has a superpower so that you can activate. And I am already sold because you've seen my, my collection of Risk games. I love Risk because the, the rules lend itself to themed versions very well. Monopoly, this is, Monopoly actual... is now It's a Monopoly game. A board game. With brand new rule sets and little mini figures As I... that expand because there's expansion figures you can buy. So there's like 12 total oh, figures no. that you can buy all different powers. They all play differently. And every time you pass go, you got to do a boss battle. And once all the bosses are done, whoever has the most coins. Because you could like you could like warp places and you can make people drop their coins. You can run by and pick them up. Like it is. So I let, me like, just, let me just say about the expansion on board games, okay? If it's a board game that Gavin ends up really liking, like Alien vs. Predator, and there's expansion pieces, he will make sure, he doesn't care how long it will take, he'll make sure he gets every single piece. I still don't have the face I, um, I, I'm Get gonna, the face I'm, I would like to pull back a curtain for a second. When they announced this game, Gavin, my, my, my phone lit up like a Christmas tree. With this man's, oh my god, did you see this? I like. Oh my god! I don't really like Monopoly, but I'm actually like kind of a new version of the new way to play Monopoly. I'm more like more video game battle wise. Okay, I'm I'm looking forward to that part. I'm totally cool with it. Let's go with it. You know how we said about Resident Evil? Why didn't you just make another game and not call it Monopoly? Anyways, so keeping with the board game fiasco, the Jumanji trailer released today and it killed me inside because it's no longer a board game. They turned Jumanji into a video game that sucks people inside and I, The Rock does his eyebrow thing. This is going to suck Donkey Kong. I Bucks. literally just watched that today and I turned my Goku. They're making a new Jumanji thing. And she's like, and it's, it, and it's they the are. And it's it's, it's, it's from it's, Doctor Who. My question is, what's wrong with keeping it in the board game universe? It's like you're telling people... Forget board games. Let's just do video games. It's exactly. nowhere near as real getting sucked in the video game. They could have called it. It could have been Tron. It could be. But anything I do. Else. I do appreciate the cast. I think the. I mean, it has Jack Black in it. The Rock. Who is a woman on the inside because that's his avatar character going. Oh my God! I'm a middle-aged fat man. This movie just is gonna suck. I um. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna. But I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna hold off on my critique on it until I actually go see the movie. And then I'll get my routine. Wait, you're gonna give it money? But from the trailer of what I saw, 
I, I'm not impressed with it. I, I'd rather go see Hitman's Bodyguard with and uh, The Foreigner with Jackie Chan. That yeah, that trailer dropped. So that, everyone's that, like, that, "Ooh, that Jumanji!" Good. I'm like, "Where's the board game?" Because that was the fun. Because it really ruined. Like, you had to survive. You don't have super video game power ups and stuff like they have in this movie. Well, Once the power I, goes out. And, okay, first and secondly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who was dumb enough to make a video game of a board game that sucks you in? That's the like, that's the background <laughs> that's the backstory I want to know about. Is this how it is became the a video worst game. idea in video game history. Be- the, the, next the thing, to the virtual board. And the thing about it is like it's supposed it's giving away the legend of the whole entire theme of it. It's like where I just I don't like it, guys. All right, I'm not, so ugh. yeah, Come Jumanji. On. We don't like it. We're not happy. Jeffrey will watch it and he'll poke his eyes out afterwards. Yes, I'll gouge my eyes out probably during it. So right now. It's time for this week's Geek vs. Geek. Now, Pocky was supposed to judge, but because Jeffrey is so clueless on all things Sega... Not Pocky all things goes, Sega. I've played a few no, games. Okay, okay. Pocky played was like, I will take on Gavin in this. Trust me. So, so, and I'm looking forward to this. I'm okay. sure the fans are, too. Yes, because one of us picked a good game and one of us did something else. We will find <laughs> out on Geek vs. Geek. Coming up right after this. Today we're going to be, so we have a Sega games that they're going to be competing off. Each contestant, ha, or each person has one uh, intro, uh, one minute for rebuttal, and one minute for exit. Anyone there? So you two, go ahead and take it off. And we're going to start with Gavin. All right. I picked Fantasy Zone as a revival game because oh. this was one of my first ever Master System games, and you flew around in a little spaceship called Upa Upa, mm-hmm. and you just had a good deal of fun. And you, it was revolving worlds, and you built up to a boss battle, and this was just something amazing. I think for a revival game with the way games are going now, this will be perfect because you create your own Upa Upa with a little pilot, mix it with Mass Effect, mix it with No Man's Sky, make this epic online new Fantasy Zone type of game where custom characters can fly around and save the universe. That's neat. Or maybe take an MMO route where you have good guys and bad guys the way it all works out. I think Fantasy Zone would be definitely one of the better properties that would be fresh enough and new enough that would get people attention. <coughs> okay, I like that. That's a really good intro for uh, that Fantasy Zone. Hmm. All right, well, let's go ahead and hit Pocky. My game is Virtual Odd. A game that would today would be awesome because everyone's like, everyone loves giant robots. You love giant robots? I they, love giant robots. Love, everyone, everyone loves knows giant that. robots. <laughs> giant robots are the thing. This was a four player, multiplayer, online ability because it was Sega Dreamcast. Virtual on giant robot fighting game. Fast? Oh, it was. High speed was its thing. Lasers, swords, guns, missiles, homing beacons. Everything was at your disposal. And you had online capability, which was fun. And in th- this day and age, that's a big deal. The fact that this franchise already had all that built into it, going up to the new age, adding multi- multiple parts, new uh, upgrades, and everything else would be great. And to this day, I think with the systems, we could have easily a great franchise with a lot of ability to, to, to add on to it and go on forward. Okay. Well, yeah. that's pretty interesting. Good intro so far for you guys. So, Gavin, go all ahead right. and uh, fight back. <laughs> yeah, giant robots are fun. Everybody loves giant robots. But we have enough giant robots. We've got enough Gundam games. We've got enough Mech Assault games. We've got all sorts of robot games out there that are available. We need freshness in video game franchises. We are recycling the same things over again. So let's go back to a classic. Fix what was wrong with No Man's Sky. Fix what was wrong with the new Mass Effect. Mash them together and give us this epic fantasy zone where you can fly around with other people, take on missions, fight epic boss battles. The story alone was pretty epic because, you know, the Oop Oop is a little living spaceship where you can make your own, upgrade it with different things you find throughout the galaxy, and just become this awesome, like, like what Scalebound could have been. But seriously, something new to just breathe some life into our gaming ecosystem so it's not just another giant robot game. As much as I love Ro- uh, Virtual On, I would rock you with Faye in any day of the week. You would be down in a heartbeat. <laughs> but I'm telling Whoa. you, we need seconds. new stuff, period. Wow. Okay. Well, that's a really good uh, attack right there. So, uh, Pocky, what do you got to defend yourself with? You know, you're right. We do have a lot of show by giant robots. We have nothing but giant robots of three companies. We have Namco's, and we have with the Gundam. And it's virtually almost always the same Gundam game. It's either a Musou giant Gundam game where you're going through fields, wiping out guys, leveling up, 
carry new gear to go back to the field again, kill, repeat, rinse, either repeat, till you max level. The other giant robot games we have are MechWire, which is going through more legal battles than anyone else I have ever seen before, because they keep <laughs> screwing over all their artists and content creators, but we won't go into that. But what we go into is that Virtual On kept it simple, but it was just a couple more add-ons. Yes, you're right, We there are a lot, but there are a lot that are overly complicated for no Ten good seconds. reason. I think if we just kept it to its core of easy changeable parts with new armor and quick online play, it will be a lot of fun, just like Overwatch. Okay, you were cutting it close there. That's sure. All right, some really good defense intros there. We got some really good uh, defenses. So let's go ahead and exit out. Gavin. All right. Yeah, a simple virtual on game that you're pitching may be kind of fun, but it's too simple for today's gamer market. They need something that's going to involve them and be more inviting. I should win just because I didn't bring up Space Channel 5. Let's be real honest here. I bring that <laughs> up every month. I feel like failed. <laughs> but <laughs> Fantasy Zone would be something, a blast from the past, which people are really jumping on these days, wanting to get more of the retro feel and things. Even if it looked like the the last night, that when they premiered, it's 2D, pixelated, but 3D. You could do so much with an open world game of space exploration because people we don't have a lot of that anymore. And better Mass Effect, because everyone loves Mass Effect. Do something really fun, fresh, good, and it, I didn't say Space Channel 5. Oop, oop, all the way! Or Opa, Opa, however you want to say it. <laughs> See, I think you even know how it's called. <laughs> hey, right. I gave my Fantasy Zone to the Austin Toy That was a good ending from the Fantasy Zone. Virtual on, go ahead and uh, give us your exit. Yo, you're right. There are not a lot of open world, open space games that are all abundant and either coming up soon or not. The open world thing is big. It's actually right now the default setting for all the games we're coming out. But a simple brawler game, Overwatch is a great example of simple yet deep gameplay. I didn't say simple, but I did not, it can be deep. Virtual On could give people that. Leveling up, giving new skills, and giving people a quick in and out fighting tournament, a fighting scenario is going to be a lot of fun. With open world environments they can provide is easy. I think with, with if you take the Overwatch model or the uh, Team Fortress Team Fortress style of gameplay, where people get in, out, and do quick st quick matches, this could easily be one of the best franchises we've seen in a long time. Oh, okay. This is a hard one because these are both good franchises. Oh wow. <laughs> So, I have not played either one of them. I actually did my research a little bit and kind of looked both of them up to see what you guys were talking about beforehand. Uh, Pucky, you get some really good pointers there about, uh, you know, the brawler side and everything else like that. But, Gavin, you gave a really great side about, you know, the open world custom making and such like that. So, in this one, in, in the Geek versus Geek, I'm going to have to say... Fantasy Zone. <laughs> what? Yes! No, you know what? I, I give you that. Living Spaceship Eggs for the I'm win. sorry, but that really got my sci-fi side on me. Like, I you wouldn't be on I, I know it was right weaknesses. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have giant robots, and you like giant robots. I she do like giant, giant robots. robots. Yes. yes. But I think, I, and the thing is, I, don't th I think there's a lot of room for all these franchises. I'd love to see them. Yeah. Back. Sega needs to bring them back. I think both of these would be really nice to bring back either way, but I gotta say Fantasy Zone definitely hit the notch. So guys, this was our Geek vs. Geek, so stay tuned for more content. Welcome back to the show. I'm sorry. Like, Virtual One was really hard to go up against, yes. just so you know, because I played the crap out of that game. I had little Faye in figures, and when she went into her god mode, it was done. Yeah. Like, it people was, would hide behind boxes. What was hilarious was uh, I asked some of our other staff members if they knew what this game was, and one of them was like, no. And I'm like, this is such a your game. Like, this is a yeah. your game. And they looked up, and I showed them gameplay footage. They're like, why haven't I played this game? I'm like, well, it's on a system that hasn't been around for, like, 20 years. So we are joined today as we talk in our skinky out with Sega with Sega. Uh, the one time president of Sega of America, Tom Kalinsky, who's joining us via Skype. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hi, guys. How's it going? We are doing good. Were you listening to our Geek vs. Geek a second ago? Well, I couldn't hear it. Oh, we were, we were deciding which, which franchise needs a reboot. I picked Fantasy Zone, he picked Virtual Law, and it was a really bad argument. It was a really good argument. We both made really good cases for them both come back. But I wanted the end with Fantasy Zone because that was an amazing game. I'm still having trouble hearing you. You're going to have to speak up. All right. Uh, so we'll just good? be a little louder. How's All that? Right. 
How's that? Okay, that helps. All right. So, yeah, we are joined by Tom Kaliski today, who was the head of Sega of America and really kind of shaped a lot of our gamer futures. Like, yeah. I still have my original Master System. I had the Genesis, the 32X. I had a friend that had the Saturn, and the Dreamcast blew me away. Like, there were so many good things. And I thought, who better to bring on than the man responsible for most of that? So, thank yeah. you for being on the show and having a good time with us today. Um, we want to just t- briefly talk a little bit about how you got involved with Sega because we read Console Wars when it came out, major book, but mm-hmm. you went from toy making to going to Sega. Like, what was the transition of that like? Yeah, you do. Okay. Well, uh, it really wasn't that difficult of a transition for me. Um, remember when I was at Mattel, we had started Mattel Electronics and uh, actually the handheld bit games ported to and the guys who developed in television originally reported to me, but then the directors decided to spin it off as a separate company. Yeah. But anyway, I was familiar with television and and uh, you know, ColecoVision and Atari back in those days. Uh, then I got out when I left Patel. I didn't have anything to do with video games. A uh, friend of mine and I bought Matchbox toys out of receivership in the UK. Yeah. Oh, oh. And we turned the company around. It was it's, it was in receivership because it was losing money. We went profitable, turned it around. And while I was running that company, Ayo Nakayama contacted me, the CEO of Sega, and he contacted me and said, "Hey, would you guys like to distribute Sega Master System in uh, Europe? Because we had very strong distribution in Europe." And then he asked me if we would want to distribute it in. The United States, and uh, I looked at it. Uh, no, hear me. Is it, is it the audio okay? Because I'm hearing a, a few pieces. Yeah, you're you're, you're kind of going up and down on your end over there. All right, well, I'll I'll try to speak closer to my uh, laptop. I guess. Okay. Uh, but it, oh, so I knew I not keep um, and after we sold Matchbox to uh, Tyco, I was on vacation with my kids in Hawaii and Hawaii, right? And uh, all of a sudden, I'm up here at the beach in uh, Hawaii and said, hey, I've been for you. I really think you need to come with me. Yeah. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of back audio on this. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of voices. Hold on, we're going to turn it down out here just a little bit. Okay. I'm not sure you can hear me or at, at all, because I'm hearing a whole lot of voices. I'm hearing a lady's voice. I'm hearing a guy's voice. Oh, that might be in our production booth. They might have the mic turned on in there, so... The mic is on in your, uh, in your uh, booth or something, because I'm, I'm hearing a whole lot of talking. Okay, that would be them in the production booth, so they're going to fix that right now. So one of the things that we want to look at is... You were part of it from, I guess, the Master System to the Dreamcast, correct? Not quite, no. I was, I was part of it from uh, 80, early 90 through launch of Saturn. I didn't have anything to do with the Dreamcast. Yeah. So one of the things we want to talk about is how Sega was really in, innovative in the things that they did like long before anybody else really thought yeah. about it. Like, it's amazing when you think about everything we take for granted today Sega was trying to do a long time ago, but the technology just wasn't where it was at. So, like, the first thing is there was a game subscription service called Sega Channel that included downloadable games. Yes. Well, that's like net, that's like Gamefly today. That's like the Xbox Games Pass. That's the Games with Gold and the PlayStation Plus. All that stuff is so commonplace now, but Sega kind of started that. Yeah, I mean, Sega had, uh, uh, Sega had modems and attachments to Internet. I mean, I know that was yeah. some of the Japanese stuff, but I think, yeah, they really... They they had a lot of innovation. They they were the first ones to go CD or, or disc base that was out of the cartridge market. They had they had external memory uh, cartridges to put their games onto. That's something like Sony and Microsoft was doing before you know back yeah. in the day, or even Nintendo. So were, were yeah, you part right. of Sega Channel? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize how difficult technically back in those days it was to do the Sega Channel. I, and 
we basic my head of R and D, Joe Miller, was ready to kill me over that when I signed the deal with uh, TCI and Time Warner to, to do a game subscription service on their cable networks across the United States. And he came to me one day and he said, "You don't realize what you're making us do. Every cable box in every city across the United States." slightly different specifications and he took me into this huge room that we had at the back of Sega in uh, Redwood City and here were literally I'm not exaggerating hundreds of cable boxes and he said we have to design a connector that works with every one of these damn things and everyone is different uh, but we got it done and it was a great cable service we had 150,000 subscribers at $15 a month Back in the mid '90s, and nobody had ever done anything like that, and it was it was really cool. I was really I was really proud of us for doing doing that. So now that you see how it is today, are you thinking, man, you guys got it way lucky? We got way what? Lucky. That like, when you see how it is today, you're like, man, you guys have it lucky compared to what we had to do back then. That's that's right. The internet makes everything so much easier in many respects. Uh, uh, you know, and, and back then, when you mentioned we went from uh, cartridges to uh, CD-ROM. Yeah, that had not been done before. And again, people today, you know, we knew that optical discs were the way to go, but we didn't know how to program on optical discs because it was different than programming for uh, for cartridges. First of all, what we discovered we had to do was kind of do it everything linearly and then download ahead of where the game player was content that he was about to play into memory that was residing in the machine because you we couldn't we couldn't skip across the disk to different parts of the gameplay uh, automatically you know we had to do it a different way so there were a lot of obstacles to overcome and and of course we were looking to combine 3D animation with live action, with great rock and roll music, and that had never been done before. So all these things were, I mean, it seems simple today, but they were very difficult back then. And that brings us to one of our next innovations. It was Dreamcast, which you want to take this one? So the Dreamcast was was, was the system I promoted the stuffings out of. It had a 56K modem, mm -hmm. had four-player port. At the time, there was only one of the system. Obviously, you could tell who ripped off who on that one. You had a <laughs> VMU memory card that all had a mini screen attached to it, which allowed external gameplay, which we would now use our cell phones for. Which also, mm -hmm. it was a multifunction. You could browse the internet. You could play games. It had like, a, it had a, th but there was one other thing that, and you're gonna love me for this one because we keep talking about this thing. Hit me up. <laughs> but it was also the first console to to get, uh, well, other than the Neo Geo arcade machine that had like five hundred dollar yeah. cartridges, was the first one that professional gamers were using you had street fighter mm -hmm. you had mortal Kombat, you had rival schools you had power stone uh, st uh so you had a couple amazing of amazing games amazing games that were being played at tournament tournament level and they, the system of choice was the dreamcast because it had an analog stick had quick buttons and it also had great arcade controlling and it and had the system to do it and it had online so they could do that. That is something we all take for granted now. My yeah. Xbox has all my apps. It plays all my movies. It yeah. has all my games. Like, yeah. PlayStation's the same way. It has all that stuff. And this was way way before anyone really thought that was a thing. So, like, the Dreamcast, I think, was the last actually groundbreaking system. Yes, because before you it get to literally, Yeah, it literally went to a point where it set the tone for how we are spoiled today. We are all completely spoiled. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll give you a little history on that. As I mentioned to you at the start of this, I really didn't have a lot yeah. or anything to do with the Dreamcast, except that, uh, again, my head of R&D in the United States, Joe Miller, was just a brilliant guy. And when we were working on Genesis, we knew we had to have a new system eventually. And, you know, we did the CD-ROM attachment to the Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, but then we looked at the specs of what was this Saturn. The, the next system after Genesis before Dreamcast. Yep. And Joe and I didn't feel that the specs were good enough. And Joe really wanted, even though the internet was in its infancy, infancy then, he wanted to have internet connectivity to the 
Saturn, well, uh, what, be, what became the Saturn. And, uh, you know, we obviously didn't succeed with that battle. But we did, I think it's referred to in the book Console Wars by Blake Harris. I think this story is in there. We were very, very close with Sony in those days yes, where they yes. had hardware. Yeah, so and because uh, it takes a while to develop hardware, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And we were very close with Olaf Olafsson and Mickey Shuloff, the president of Sony of America. And we decided it would make sense if we did a combined Sega Sonic Sony system that would share the. Everybody loses money on hardware, actually, in the first few years. Share yeah. the loss on hardware, and then whoever did the best software be their profits. Each company would profit individually from the software that they generated. Yeah. And we'd somehow split the, the third party uh, software revenues, uh, the licensing fees from it. So we went to Japan and Sony, the president of Sony Japan agreed this was a great idea. We went to Sega Japan and said, what? No, we don't want to do that. We don't want to help uh, Sony. They don't know how to do video games. Why should we help them? But just think how the world would be different if we had done, and by the way, in the combined spec that Joe Miller and the, the R&D guys at Sony America had developed, it had internet connectivity. So we would have had internet connectivity on being after the Genesis, and it would have been a combined Sega-Sony platform. Maybe it would have been called the Sony-Sega platform, or the Sega-Sony PlayStation, or the Sega or the Sony Sega Saturn, who knows what it had been called. But anyway, that was what was going on way back then for Dreamcast. See, that kills me because I would still be a PlayStation junkie today if it was the Sega Sony thing. Like, I jumped from PlayStation to Xbox because that was as close to what Sega was doing with Dreamcast because I'm a very social gamer. So that had the hardware, the specs, and the way that they ran things because that's how I play. So if we had actually had this, you and I would still be playing PlayStation together. I, I think hilariously is, is the story gets kind of repeated a couple of years later with another company who had a mascot that was an Italian plumber that um, <laughs> that ended up screwing up, screwing over, and not saying screwing over, but like they ended up screwing, getting screwed over by another, screwed over by a company and then jumping into the console market because they had all that technology. Why waste it? Um... I, you said you went to the Sega Japan. Was it? And this is something I noticed with Sega when we were doing research on Sega titles because of, of our you know what we do. I noticed there was a lot of Sega titles that never made it to the states for one reason or another. For almost like it almost seemed like no reason. W were you having trouble getting some of the games to come to the United States? For I don't know. it, it wasn't necessarily that we were having trouble getting them to the United States. We would. Sometimes it was just uh, difficult to get the a translation done, or we, we would do some research on it and find out that it didn't do as well in the United States. And, and remember, even though we were very, it's in the heyday of Genesis, we passed Nintendo in share of market. Yes. We were very successful in the United States. Remember, Sega Japan never had more than a 10% share yep. of the Japanese market. So it was very hard to determine which of their games were really good because most of them never reached the level of unit sales that we had on our worst playing games in America. Yeah. So, you know, it was, a, it was a hard thing to decide and you had to leave it up to our internal game playing guys and then also doing some internal research. But I don't remember if we wanted one, I don't remember it being extraordinarily difficult to get it uh, uh, to the United States. I remember one of the titles that everybody laughed at us bringing over uh, oh gosh, now I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, Zui. Um, gosh, I'm looking at my Suikoden? old. Suikoden? Oh, here. Herzog Zui. You remember that game? Yes. Which one? Herzog. Great game. Oh, Herzog, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and it actually, that was a Japanese title, and it, and it actually did it very, very well in the United States. I think we did better in the U.S. with it than it did in Japan. I think one of the big titles. So, anyway. So the last bit of innovation that Sega brought that I really want to talk about because this is something we all take for granted. You know we have to thank for our little joystick controller? The Knights game and the Knights pad they made. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's not the D-pad, it's the joystick controller. Yeah. We now have two of those on our, on our game controllers. Like I don't even think about how that started. And that was the new fact that I discovered was 
that was created for knights. And I was like, wait, yes. wait, what? I yeah. totally missed that part. No, I, I, I knew about this one. Yeah, it was developed for knights because knights is supposed to be a fully 3D mm-hmm. and fly, flyable, fly, flyable environment. And they're like, okay, well, you can't really do an angle with a four-point yeah. controller. Which, that actually That's helps. hard. Yeah. So how much fun was it to come up with that joypad? Again, I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but I, do, I recognize the problem you were talking about. And uh, yeah, we felt that we just had to have that uh, in order to play the game properly. Uh, but I don't remember the specifics. If, if that was one that, uh, again, Joe Miller was the lead designer on, or who was the, who was the head uh, R&D guy on that. But obviously it was a good idea. Well, we're going to get to talk about some of the Sega games we love, like... First, I'm going to ask you, what is your absolute favorite Sega game that you made of all time? Well, for me, my favorite, and I know this is a little controversial, but my favorite is still Sonic 2. I think Sonic 2 was the best Sonic game we made. I know a lot of people think Sonic 3 was the best Sonic game we ever made. But I really, I really love playing Sonic 2. And also because it really, you know, emotionally, it, it drove the success Sega brand. Yeah. That's what allowed us to do Sonic Tuesday and establish that Tuesday was the day that video games from Creator forever Rose on would be yeah. <laughs> released. And we really remember, again, it had never been done before. Nope. We had Sonic 2 in every retail outlet in America and Europe on that Tuesday. Uh, and some of the stores opened at 12.01 after midnight, you know, minute after midnight. Uh, they all they all had it ready to go on the shelves on the same day, and that had never been done before. So in mo- that uh, that I relate to, I love the gameplay, but I also love the fact that it really wants to be uh, over the top in success. I love Sonic too, but you know what I hated about it? Tails always dragging just behind you on the special zones to get hit by those damn mines. That's true. That's what he's there for. Breaking up again. Oh, yeah, we were talking about the worst part of Sonic 2 was Tails in the special stage, how he's always just a fraction of a second behind you. Boom! There goes your rings on a mine. Uh, guys, I can't hear you. Breaking oh, up. yeah, you, you froze there for a second. So, yeah, Sonic 2 was a good deal of fun. Pocky, what is your favorite Sega game? My, fa- uh, my favorite Sega game was, uh, well, I mean, from the Master Era, was actually... Um, Blah, 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 blah. Uh, was actually Sonic also, too. Sonic 3 actually was mine. Yeah. Mine is Space Channel 5. I am such oh, a Space I... Channel 5 junkie. Like, I wrote oh. a script in my house on how to do it as a movie. Wait. I had statues. Like, any Sega game. Oh, I thought you were just meaning for the Master System. No, Sorry. I didn't say anything. Oh, my, 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 absolute, my absolute Sonic's favorite was either Virtual On or uh, uh, Velvet. For the Dreamcast, it, yeah. no Sega for the Sonic for the Sega Dreamcast was awesome. Uh, was awesome for, the, for the Dreamcast was awesome, yeah. So it's been a lot of fun having Tom Klitschke on to just kind of talk about Sega and just geek out with him a little bit. It's been a lot of fun. Sorry for the connection problems on Skype right now, but thank you for being on the show. You've made his year. <laughs> yeah, and just hearing you talk about Sonic Two and just the funness because Console Wars was amazing. I cannot wait to see how they're gonna do the movie. Like I love it. You shaped a lot of people without probably ever knowing it at the time and now you're just this historical figure for Sega that I'm glad that I got to talk to so thank you for being on fan service today with us and keep up the good work thank you for being part of the industry okay. we love so much yeah it's my pleasure uh, thanks for doing what you do I love the fact that there are so many people that relate the games and the things that we did way back in the 90s and I do think it really led forward to building this industry from a relatively small industry to a hundred billion dollar industry and we you know, extended the age range of players from just children and teens to college and post-college and you know now I think the average age of a game player is probably 35 or something and yeah. I think that's just terrific yeah. and you had a heavy hand in that so I guess we all have to say thank you as gamers all these esport gamers everything because yep. Sega really set the standard for today's gaming industry. I'm not even going to lie. Looking at the list of everything and the great franchises, people back here nodding like, yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, once again, thanks for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed it, and just thank you immensely for everything you've done. All 
All right, thanks, guys. Talk thanks, soon. sir. All right, so that was been our Sega Talk with Tom Kalinske. I had lots of fun with that one, despite all of our Skype technical problems. But you know what? It's not done. Pocky and I have a brand new 10 things list for you of forgotten Sega games that you may have forgotten about, but we still know about and how much fun they are. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with 10 things after this. No, 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 no. Hi yo, top ten time. Hey, hold on. Yes. <laughs> no, this way. This way. We, we, st we stand on this edge of the table. Yeah, yeah, but you're half cut off. Well, you're because you shoved me off. Don't lie. Okay, whatever. You're like, fine. The show is mine. So, so, so with our top ten list, this time we need a clarification. When we say Sega games, we mean cam games that were either published or made by Sega. Yes. We're not talking about just games that were on the system like Gauntlet. True. That was there, but we we, we appreciate. The Ghost of Christmas Pass has arrived. Um. But these are games made or published by Sega. So these are our top ten of those. You get to kick it off. My number ten is Deep Fear. Deep Fear was a survival horror game made for the Ooh. Sega Saturn? Yeah, probably. Because it looks like a Saturn game. It does a Saturn game. This Deep Fear was basically... Remember the movie Leviathan? Yep. And Yeah, you basically played a rescue guy. Uh, a team member of a rescue team goes down. And then bad things happen. Very, very, very bad. Your parents would not approve of actions. And it was a lot of fun. It was... It were kind of a Resident Evil clone, but it was a Resident Evil clone with actually even more claustrophobia attached to it. Yeah. It was underwater in a very contained area, and you knew that if that bre that thing breached, well, the it ocean was, was coming. Fun. The bre the ocean was coming for your face. Not as much fun as my number nine, which is Wonder Boy, one of the earlier easy intros into the world of role playing games. Wonder Boy was just fun. It was easy. It was very. It was kind of Zelda ish. It was very Zelda. -ish. It was a great intro into. My future in our role playing games, like games like Final Fantasy and Star Ocean, these other ones. Yeah, it was just, it was so much fun. You had Wonder Boy and Monster World. You had all these fun little games. You're like what, like four or five? There's four or five. I have yeah. the collection at home, the vintage yes. collection on my Xbox. <laughs> I can't play it as well these days as I did back then because I'm spoiled by too many buttons. What can I yeah. say? Also spoiled by speed. Some of those old RPGs are yeah, like... Yeah, they're real slow. Dude. Like, come on now. I I can't. Yeah, but it as, for the right time. Now. Holy crap, it kind of helped define and get people into a genre that may not have existed in this state. For the Sega, yeah. Yep. For the Sega Master System. Mine is for the Sega Master System also. My next one, number eight. Vector Man! Vector Man was also on the Genesis. Se yeah, Sega Genesis, sorry. Yeah, the Genesis does. It was on the Genesis. <laughs> Sega Genesis, sorry. This was on the Genesis. This was awesome. Yeah, Vector Man was a lot of fun. It was It was actually a, a, a full push the system to its graphically extent. It, like, this was one of the last games for the system. Mm -hmm. This comes out toward the end. This was like their next mascot they were hoping for. I think they should have tried a little bit harder to make it that way. Cause he's not as memorable as Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm going to tell you that right now. He's not as memorable as Sonic the Hedgehog. He could, he could have easily rivaled Mega Man. He could have rivaled Mega Man pretty easy. I'm not going to give you that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that much. And I think I think if they had a couple more games, a couple more iterations, a little bit more fun. I think if they brought him back now, I think this one would definitely work. And I think it would be a lot of fun. So my next on the list is Outrun. This you, is, mean, you mean Quarter Eater? Sorry. Space Harrier is the next one on my list. Um... I'm a, I jumped ahead of myself because I love Outrun so much. But Space Harrier was a whole lot of fun going through the little 3D space and blowing stuff up and just going back. Like, you had Duke Nukem on a jetpack. How can you go wrong? And it was actually one of the first games to use, like, 3D, sort yeah. of. Like, you had to, like, and yeah. this is another one of those games that desperately needed an analog stick. Yeah, but still, it worked. Lots and lots of fun on Space Harrier. And how much does Sega like it? They put it in another video game as an extra. Mm -hmm. What do you have? Fun? My next this one, one, I would tell you, I don't remember at all. Okay, this one was because I love... Do you remember full motion video game? Yes. Games? Games? Um, there were movies basically as games. And Dracula Unleashed was one of those. It was <laughs> kind of a sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Sort of, kind of. You played a guy named Tex who's from America who's come to, to like see about his cousin's death and a bunch of stuff. And it had full motion video that was about this big. Yeah. And it was, it was all 23 colors and... It, I completely forgot about this game. He brought it was like, oh, damn, how did I forget about this one? It, it, the best part was, like, you could beat it in, like, two hours, but because mm -hmm. that's the length of a movie. Um, it also had a lot of different endings and multiple deaths, and this was kind of one of those things that's really enjoyable. Also, the acting in it is sci-fi channel worthy. It, you almost <laughs> want to play it just to make fun of it now these days. Oh, that's it's, pretty it's, bad. It's pretty fun. All right, so next up on the list is my number five, and this number is five. been uh, a lot of fun. Oh, Echo yeah. the Dolphin. Dolphins yes. and Aliens. Dolphins. Can't go wrong. 
cannot go wrong with... No, no, no. Dolphins, aliens, and time travel. Yeah. Dolphins, aliens, time travel. Nobody could have pulled that off at Sega. I'm just going to tell you right now. No. You would There's swim no around the ocean. You fought squids, giant alien heads and eggs, and time traveled. Hands down, this is a game that would not have beauty. worked as well today because we're spoiled. But this was amazing. Echo, uh, that freaking dolphin. Also, and apparently Jeffrey knows what that game is. He I don't think it out. is. <laughs> Good guy. What if Jeffrey knows? Also, this game, also, if it came out today, would totally be like environment, like super environmental. The bad guys would be like oil corporations. Yeah, and it would be aliens. It would be a base. dolphin saving things from SeaWorld. Us. What do you have on your next list? My next one is an old fashioned. Uh, now, some of the iterations change with the style, but it's an RPG. Shining Force. The Shining franchise as a whole for Sega was awesome. It had like four or five. Uh, your characters interacted with each other before a battle. If characters died, they died, except for the main hero. Of course, he would come back, but you lose half your money. It was a great bit. It was good versus evil. There were Isn't backs- that pretty much all RPGs? Well, no, no, no but, I mean, like, but I mean, like, this one was like, a, like the evil expanded multiple games. Uh, there was even a prequel that explained like two characters and why they hated each other. And it, yes, it literally took an entire game to explain why they hated each other. It was really a lot of fun. And this franchise, I, I would like to see. Please. All right. So number three on our list today is Outrun. I loved Outrun. I spent so much money on Outrun in the arcades. I played yeah. it so much on the console that my joypad was a little off because I kept pushing buttons. It was like deceptively easy but really hard at the same time. You know my favorite thing about this was Sega's marketing on this was brilliant. They put it in every restaurant. Yeah. I mean, if you were as a restaurant like ponchos or whatever it is, you, there was there was Outrun. And it's like, okay, um, uh, mommy, I don't want to eat any more food, blah, blah, blah. Okay. No more tacos for me. I'm going to go play Outrun. I'm going to go play Outrun now. And the parents can have their conversations, and the kid would go through like $2 worth of Outrun, and that would be it. That's like, what, five minutes? Yeah. Oh, dear God. So much fun. Such a good time waster. Such a fun game. The blonde with the hair waving and the California music playing with it. Yeah, loved yeah. Outrun. Oh, yeah. And then its sequels were a lot of fun. Where yeah. They had a lot more interesting. Outrun USA, Outrun California. It was great. Yeah. So what's your number two? My number two is actually my debate from earlier, which was Virtual <laughs> On. Yeah. And the reasoning is, I really love this franchise. This was, not this franchise, this game. And this is one of those, it came out toward the end of the system, or when the system was, was reaching its end. It didn't have enough time, I feel. I think this is. It was good. an arcade game. It worked really well in the arcade. It worked really well in the arcade. The fact they had multiple analog sticks and lots yeah, the of yeah, two art. joysticks and just yeah. yeah and the fact that the VMU for the Dreamcast controller acted as something else. The game was a lot of fun. I think this is one of those lost gems that desperately did not get it. Desperately needs more time. Needed more time and did not get it. So this leads us to the top of the list of mine, which is not space. It's not Space Channel 5. It is Fantasy Zone. I picked my topic one as well because this game really was so bright and colorful and fun. I could still sing the music in my head, and I don't remember at times I'm singing the music in my head. But it was one of those ones that started with the real story where the bad guy was your dad. And it was just really fun to play, but it was like this is the one only time I ever called a video game helpline was to how to beat the final boss, and they had just released the Genesis, and what it was was, well, maybe, we don't really know, maybe you just need to move around a bunch. I waited 20 minutes for you to tell me that. I already know that. Come on now. Only time I've ever called a help game helpline. I think also this is this one, <laughs> one of the first games to really show off games as colorful. Like, it, mm-hmm. it was really, really colorful. And the gaming industry today, we really desperately need to remember what color it looks like. Because everything is drab. So that's yeah. been our 10 things list of... Sega games that we have forgotten were out there and that we really need to show some more love to. What did you think? I think it's good, but guess what? It's time for something new and find that Pocky's going to do, so... It's time for kind of a Pocky Box return, with me doing something kind of different new with this one. All right, so here comes Pocky Box. Let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen! Good! Like I said, with Pocky Box, I'm trying something new. Normally, I do lots of ranting. In this case, I am doing an ode to Sega. Ready? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. For I am not here to bury Sega, for rather to praise it. The good names of good games beyond go beyond a system's death. Hoth, a Sega has paid for. 
Let it be known that Sega is just let it be known that with Sega the, the noble Nintendo has sold Sega was not innovative. If it was so, it was a previous fault, a grievous fault ha, has fault as, as Sega has answered for. I'm sorry, guys. Say it, Sega. I keep trying to say it. Sega. Answer here under leaves Nintendo. The rest for Nintendo is un, 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 an innovative co company. So it would be an innovative company is Nintendo. Did Sega not seem to innovate? When the masses asked for CD quality, did not Sega make the Sega CD and the Saturn? Innovation should not be made, made of newer stuff. Yet Nintendo says it lacked innovation. And Nintendo is an innovative company. Three times did Sega offer, get offered a good franchise. Three times did Sega get denied by the gamers. Sega brought us many games. And did many games bring it? So Nintendo is an honorable company. And did Nintendo bring innovation? Maybe. But Sega now lies here with my heart and controller. And my friends, I ask you, give me a moment to weep. I am Chris Maynard. This has been the Pocky Box, and I promise next time it will be way more funny, and I will try not to use words that make my tongue not work. <laughs> that was good. Why well, is awesome. that? Don't make his tongue work, huh? <laughs> Look, I'm going to be honest. Trying to change Shakespeare's rhythm and beats to make it fit Sega and the word of innovative. Next time, we should like do the light and give you like the little skull yeah. of Sonic the Hedgehog. That would be... Uh, that would be <laughs> skull of Sonic the Hedgehog? Yeah, that that just has a bunch of little spikes, spikes coming out. <laughs> that, would be, that would be Hamlet, and that would be to be or out to be. And I, I think it was like, great. Yeah. I think it was great. I, was like, right, I enjoyed it. So it was awesome, dude. Yeah. We've had a really fun show today. It was, yeah. it was really we great. We got to geek out. You actually knew a Sega game. Was no, I was like, okay. Like, I know, you know that game. Well, the thing is about Sega is like there's some games that you guys have started mentioning. I'm like, wait a minute, what? And I have to look at the picture in the visual. I'm like, wait a minute. But that dolphin game, dude, nothing beats space time, continuum, dolphins. Fighting aliens. Fighting aliens. Yeah, and jelly, think, giant jellyfish. Let's I think the a think, holes. See, see, Jeffrey knows was stuff. It it's just you and I, like, we, like, went way too far into our fandoms. Yeah, and we did. We, so, we, so all right, that's yeah. been it for this show. Next week, we're going to kick off season eight with a behind the scenes where the Krugers come out and tell their stories and we relive the past year. Are you going to put on the last again? Year, they brought me a placenta cape last year, but we're not doing that this year because that joke is now done. <laughs> that joke is I already done. see Chris Glover trying not to laugh, and Jake over there wasn't here for placenta cape talk. So that's a that's an archive footage right there. Oh. Um, tonight on Zombie Life TV, they have a band called Brontosaurus coming in. It's going to be kind of fun. Ladies of Combat are on tonight. Ladies of Combat. Ladies and Combat. Hey Chris, our, our show is our show is called Ladies, Ladies of Combat. combat. <laughs> I think wait, he wait, just. Wait wait wait! What is what is <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> oh! So, wait, wait, wait. Should we tell? Should we tell Courtney and the girls that they're now we're having to fight to the death? They're now con combat a fandom. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> that actually sounds like a really good it's show. Like, actually, it's like the mirror universe. Stay tuned for more of the Fanboy TV Block Party. We go all the way till eleven. So do you want to catch it every week, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central, live on fanboytv.com slash live. You can catch us on YouTube and Twitch. We were broadcasting Twitch tonight, too, but I didn't tell anybody because I wanted to make sure it was going to be okay and not crash on me. Also, Apparently it's still going well. Also, we have podcasts, and one of our podcasts just, just got on over here. Got on iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio, so we're good with that. So that's it for this week. We'll be back next week. Make sure you tune in and have some more fun with us. And yeah. We'll see you guys next week. Hope now, you enjoyed the season. Now I'm going to go find a second Dreamcast and play it. Of course he is. <laughs> oh, gosh.